please join me in welcoming Chris Jones and David Mamet. Hello, everybody. It's nice to see so many people. Yeah. This is kind of an important building for you, isn't it? It's a very important building for me. I believe the last time I saw a play here was Henry Fonda doing Clarence Darrow. <laughs> it's true. And um, uh, it was my first introduction to the arts was in this building. I started taking piano lessons here in 1951. And um, <laughs> also, there was a place here called the World Playhouse that showed foreign films. And one time when I was in high school at the Francis Parker School, and they had an Ingemar Bergman festival. And it was 10 o'clock in the morning, and until I saw five Ingemar Bergman films in a row. <laughs> and I've been on Prozac ever since. <laughs> and finally, finally, that's sad but true. But finally, my, I did, my first film was called House of Games, and it, it premiered, it's the first time I ever saw it was an audience, was, it, was here at the Fine Arts Theater. So it's a very, very important building to me. You've always, you've always had this enormous affection for this town. I remember, you know, when you were last here, um, I remember asking you, uh, you you'd, you'd been given a Lifetime Achievement Award, I think, or something like that, and you were, in your typical way, sort of, you know, sort of a Lifetime Achievement Award is, is one thing. Um, but then I remember you saying to me um, something like, but I'm always happy to come back to Chicago because that always means something. And I sort of, and I, it moved me at the time. I remember thinking this city really does mean something to you as an artist and as a person. And all. I mean, it's where you're, it's where well, you're yeah. from. I mean, my, my good friend, uh, 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 Rudyard Kipling, right? Who's the kindred spirit. <laughs> was a nice Jewish kid whose name was Ru Rudolf Kipnis, as you probably know. <laughs> and he said, uh, we've only one virginity to lose, and where we've lost it, there our hearts shall be. <laughs> <laughs> I always used to... <laughs> I always used to dine out on the idea that if you really wanted to understand David Mamet, you had to understand Lincoln Avenue. On oh. the idea that, okay, uh, so this is always my grand theory, which was at the bottom of Lincoln Avenue, you had the Lincoln Hotel where you lived for a time and you, you know, you w hung out at Second City and famously mopped the floors or whatever you did there. And then you would hang out with the poker players there and over time, sexual perversity in Chicago sort of came from that time. And then I always imagine, you take the bus halfway up Lincoln Avenue to sort of, in my mind anyway, like around Irving Park, and there were those junk shops, and I was like, that's kind of the world of American Buffalo. And then at the end of Lincoln Avenue, where it meets Western, I always thought, well, that's Glengarry Glen Ross, because there's a line in Glengarry Glen Ross where one of the characters, uh, I'm not sure which one it is, Roma maybe says, oh, I used to sell cars on Western. Sure. So I always imagined they're actually in Lincoln Square. So that was always my theory, was that the key to Mama was Lincoln Avenue. Oh, that's very good. <laughs> I actually, I, I worked for this place called Web Realty, which was up at the end of uh, Lincoln Avenue, and I lived at the Hotel Lincoln, so I would take the bus, bus back and forth and work for 14 hours a day and read on the bus. I, and then I would get off the bus and go to what was then Al and Jeff's Laugh-In restaurant, and it was open all night and, you know, and have, have dinner and... Um, it's so great to be back. I was over at the Lincoln, uh, the the Union League, U Union League Club today, and I, I was telling a joke about Purim, right? And I, uh, <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> but I, I I did myself a disservice because I injured my eyes because I started to tell this joke. I said, "Are there any Jews in the audience?" And I started going like that. And <laughs> 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 yeah, there was, there was one guy, he said, you know, he, his, his, his great-great-grandmother might have been a Jew, but she, she became a Unitarian, so that's... <laughs> I gotta say, uh, <laughs> I, found, I found this, I found, I'm a little intimidated. I, I think it's because I think I saw the very worst literary interview of my entire life in which you were involved in about, it must have been about the mid-90s, and some poor interlocutor of yours 
walked out on stage, <laughs> never forgotten this, walked out on stage and said, I'm just going to say the title of your plays and I want you to shout out what comes into your head. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I remember you said, let's not talk about my work. Let's, <laughs> that's good. Let's, that's good. And you said, let's, uh, let's talk about something else. And then the guy says, I'm sorry, but all of my questions are about your work. <laughs> so that was, I, you know, that was, that, was kind of, uh, that was kind of that. And I also remember talking to an academic, this is good too, talking to an academic about you one time. And this guy says, you know, I once asked him something in a question and answer session in London, and he yelled back angrily, you must be an English professor. And then the guy said, he couldn't even see me. He'd intuited it from the question. <laughs> That's true. I, I'm, I'm so proud of that. And I, I, I don't think I did it angrily. I just, I, I just knew it. And uh, that was one of my, the high points of, of my existence. Cause, <laughs> but because our good friend Mary McCarthy, Mary McCarthy actually said, no one knows less about life than an English teacher. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> I... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I used to think, oh, I, I guess when you're a writer, you're in this, um, you're in this uh, bind of people always trying to analyze you and always trying to, you know, I'm a critic, so it's sort of my job to sort of know you, and I suppose it's your job to be unknowable on some levels, or to resent, or to even resent the act of uh, no, no, being no, known. No, no, not, not at all. I mean, um, uh, Trollope, in his a wonderful autobiography, said he decided early on, you can't have anything to do with critics. He said, <laughs> you just can't do it. He said, because whoever you are, however talented you are, however strong you are, you aren't healthy enough to deal with that interchange. So he said, I'm just going to absolutely ignore the critics <laughs> for good or ill. And he said he stuck to it his whole life, and maybe he did. So uh, I, I adopted that for many, many years, because... And I, I fell off the wagon at one point, and I, I, I was talking to a critic, and the critic said, well, you haven't talked to the critic for 10 years. Why is that? And I said, well, because they ask me all these questions. I don't know the answers to them, so whenever I talk to the critics, I feel stupid. And he said, but that's absurd. And I said, see? <laughs> This book that you've all come here to hear about and to, to take home with you is a, is a great book. I mean, I'm not, this is not some talking head who's read the first chapter. I mean, I've really devoured this book. I've read it three or four times. It is, after all, about where I work. Um, and it's an incredible book. I, I've always thought that your most revealing work, the, the work that seemed to me most revealing of you, I've always thought to be the cryptogram. Oh, thank you. What and a lovely thing to say. Thank you. Does that please you that I think that about I, that play? I, 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 I love that play so much. And, you know, we're just, we were backstage, we were talking about the great Richard Christensen. And Chris said, you know, Richard Christensen, yeah, <laughs> was res as much as anything, uh, is responsible for the existence of the Chicago theater movement. And Chris said, you know, Richard Christensen is responsible for my career. And I said, so am I, which, <laughs> which, which is true. It's absolutely true. And so are many of us. And Richard said the most wonderful thing when he came to see the play, I think, in Boston or something like that. And he said at the end of the play, this little, this, um, this uh, young boy about the, who uh, the, the play's about goes upstairs to kill himself at the end of the play. Mm -hmm. And Richard said, but in real life, he said the boy didn't go up the stairs to kill himself. He went upstairs to become a great American writer. <laughs> and I thought that was by far the, the greatest praise I ever received. Are you... Would you allow that was your most revealing work? Um, that's a good question. I think it's all, uh, I mean, it's all revealing. You know, if it's not yeah. revealing, what are you doing? You know, you're, pretend, you're pretending to be someone else. So um, it's a very personal work. It's a very, it's a domestic play. And, and I, I don't know if I ever wrote any other domestic plays. Right. But um, it's very, very much domestic. Uh, it's a domestic play. So it, it the book is dedicated to J.M., Chicago Police Department, 1924 to 1953. Yeah. So who's that? It's a guy, I don't even know if that was, that was the name that he gave. It was a, um, 
I was driving a cab in Chicago in about 1969, and uh, I got held up. And the guy had took me down to the south side, and he had a, we didn't have partitions in those days, and he had a gun, a knife to my neck. He said he's going to kill me. I, I didn't believe him, but he said it, so I gave him my money, you know, what the heck. <laughs> and I, I, fl I fl uh, and there I was all shook up, and I flagged down a cop, and a cop comes over, and I started talking to him, and he says, uh, Mamet, he says, uh, any relation to Bernie Mamet? I said, yeah, he's my dad. The cop says, we bought your house. <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story. I said, get out of here. He said, no, we bought your house. You know, the cowboy wallpaper, bibbity bobbity boo So we start talking, and uh, one thing led to another, and we went out and we had a drink, and he meets a guy in a bar. And I start talking to the guy in the bar who was a friend of his, and the guy gave me a name, and the man had been a, they, they were both African Americans, and the man was an older man, he's probably my age at that time, probably around 70, and he'd been a soldier in World War I, a highly decorated soldier, he came back and he worked in the Chicago cops, and then he went to prison. And he just started talking to me and telling these stories, and they aren't his stories in, in, in the book, but they're, they're just such marvelous stories about the old days uh, on, on, on the south side of Chicago. And, wait, and later on, so later on I was doing a, and I think it was at the event, you, I think you were there about 10 years ago, yeah. a woman came up to me because I'd mentioned her husband, I'd mentioned this event, something, and she, and she was the man's widow, the officer's widow, and she found something, they were repapering the wall, and she found something that I'd written in, in second grade where I put my name, and I put, uh, and, and I did a little drawing of a, a police star, like I wanted to be a cop, I wanted to be Marshall Dillon, and so she gave me that little red piece of paper which has been hanging over my, my desk ever since. Oh, no. The, uh, so there are two, the, the book has two reporters from the Tribune. There's one, um, one's called Parlo, one's called Mike. And the guy who plays the character of Parlo is this kind of formalist. You know, he, he sort of speaks in highfalutin language, but he's also, he's sort of a poet reporter, which we all like to ask, think of ourselves as being. It's probably why I like the book so much. But he says, he says at one point, he's written a book at the beginning of the book, and he says, some swine made more money than I, sold a story to Harper's, fooled a critic. There are those who fall with the right side up, and thereafter, whoever sees them thinks that, feather, that fella looks like heads. Read the review, choke down the prose of what in the world was the reading public thinking. No, is it not possible that culture is a field of good or bad potential, but capable, presumably, of bringing forth some fruit? And I thought, you know, it's sort of interesting that, that he says, essentially, I'm jealous, yes, of others' success, but I never envied anybody's achievement. Yeah. And that struck me as something that was you talking. I don't know. Yeah. What's well, the difference course. between success and achievement? Well, success is, you know, it, 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 uh, it's uh, not to put too fine a point on it, it's money, right? <laughs> and as Voltaire said, you know, every man's satisfied with his wit, no man's satisfied with his fortune. But if someone could actually write, I say, God bless you and, and, and thank you very much. And that's always my test about uh, uh, reading, because I read a lot is uh, can, the, can the person write a sentence because anybody can write a book, but if they can write a, <laughs> they write a sentence, I take my hat off to them. I always, you know, let me give you one other example from this book. Um, so there's a sort of crotchety city editor type in it, uh, aptly named Crouch. What else? And he says this, and he says, a newspaper is a joke, existing at the pleasure of the advertisers to mulk the public. It's M-U-L-C-T. I don't know what mulct means. Do you know what, what, what is, who knows what mulct means? It means that it means to extract with a certain amount of a nefarious attempt. Gratifying their stupidity <laughs> and render some small advance on investment to the owners, offering putative employment to their etiolated, etiolated. Yeah. Blanched, blanched out, wasted. <laughs> <laughs> to their etiolated wastrel sons in those young solons, solon, solons. Yeah, solon is a, a, Greek, a, a, a Greek wise man. 
This is a reporter at the Tribune saying all this. To those... <laughs> well, it was a while ago. Right? <laughs> In those young soul and circuit between the Fort Dearborn Club and the Everly House of Instruction. <laughs> I mean, that's fabulous. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. That's very kind. <laughs> So you, in this book, you went around and you did some historical research back in our town. You, you've got the Everly Club in there. You've got some, you've got some real addresses. Yeah. You have, uh, how did all that? Did no, you like I, prowl around on? The, well, my, my great friend, rest in peace, was uh, uh, Shel Silverstein. And um, he once said, we were, we, we, he was, the, was a marvelous man. He loved me, loved my wife, loved my family. We spent forever with him. And uh, once he says, one day he says, come on, we're going to go out and have some coffee and screw around. I say, I can't, i got to do some research. He says, never do research. When you do research, all you're doing is reading some bullshit by some son of a bitch who didn't do research. <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's kind of how I feel. But it is a mix of, it's a mix of, um, it's a mix of, of sort of uh, fictional characters. The lead characters are fictional, but in a milieu that we recognize as 1920s Chicago. Yeah, but I mean, I grew up in it. You know, it, it, it's your mother's milk. And the, the um, I was saying to somebody, the, as a historical novel, which I guess it is, in addition to being a genre novel, I'm the same distance from Al Capone as, as Leo Tolstoy was from the uh, Napoleonic Wars. So these were the, those were the stories he grew up when, in that his dad heard from his grandfather. And these are the stories that I grew up with exactly the same way as Mario Puzo, Puzo and uh, uh, Francis Ford Coppola grew up mm. with the stories of the mafia. They're the stuff of your life. Mm. You go to the Francis Parker School and they tell you across the street was the garage where they had the seven against the wall. Now you drive down Dearborn Street and so you see there's two chips in the wall where they, uh, the holy name where they shot the Dion O'Banion. Mm. You know, you w grow up in, in, on the wooded island and they say, well, that's where the, the Leopold and Loeb threw their um, typewriter into the, the lagoon at the wooded island, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of how we mark time in, in, um, in Chicago. And it occurs to me, there's an, oh, I, I was very fortunate to live many, many years in the country and there's, uh, in Vermont, and there's an old American um, tradition, an ancient American uh, uh, pastoral tradition called, uh, called bumping, which is you take the young kid, the young, basically the, the boys, because they were going to be in charge of the, the farm, and you walk them around the, the, the property. And when you get to, to a mark, the old tree, the stone wall, you bump them into them. And that's how you teach them to remember the property. So when you grow up in Chicago, at least when I did, there's a certain amount of that bumping going on, right? Oh, yeah. that's, the, uh, metro, that's where the Metropole is, and that's where Al Capone had his headquarters, mm -hmm. or the, that's in Cicero where they had, you know, he, he, he hung out over there, or that's the statue in Lincoln Park where Nails Morton got uh, thrown by his horse and kicked to death. So that's, those are our, our beloved uh, um, uh, bounds, you know. <laughs> I, in, in, the, in the book, there are these, these I, I, you know, I'm sorry for doing all this psychoanalysis, but I, I, I remember thinking, here's two sides of this guy. You've got this one reporter, the one I just quoted from, who's this sort of hyper, you know, you. And, and, then, and, then, <laughs> and then you've got the other one, Mike, who is the one I, I certainly identify more with, but also feels to me to be your romantic, because you're a romantic and a softy at heart, I've always thought. And this guy's like that. He falls in love with this Irish girl who's the, the plot of the book is he tries to find who killed her. Um, and I thought, well, that's, he's compartmentalized himself into these two different characters. And then, I th then they keep disappearing to I think it's a cabin on the Fox River. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, that's Vermont. Because he would do that. He would get out of, you know, or that's somehow that's his country. That's his absence side. So that was mine. Oh. That was how I entertained myself when I read it. I thought it was, it just seemed like many sides of you in this novel. Oh, thanks. You know, I, I just feel so much that, uh, 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 I, I really got lucky. I got into the, writing this book, and one thing led to another, and I had some really great help from my assistant, Pam Susamil, and uh, great encouragement from my agent, David Villiana, kept saying, do it again, do it again, look deeper, what's the inherent plot, work it out. And so I, uh, uh, I did it uh, many times over uh, 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 
a certain period of time. And I just looked at it at the end, and it occurred to me something Somerset Maugham said. He was looking back in, the, in his 90s at a uh, shelf full of all of his work, and he said to his uh, nephew, he said, who wrote that? <laughs> so that's kind of how I feel. You feel that about your earlier work? I feel about it the whole thing. I mean, you know. You don't recognize the person that wrote it, or you I forgotten really, him? I, I do and I don't. And I was, and, and um, there's an early, early book by Somerset Maugham, and I can't remember the name, someone will help me out. It was not, pu it was not published until later he became successful. It's called Mrs., anyone? Mrs. Something or other. It's not a good book. <laughs> but he, and he rewrote it when he became successful, he said it wasn't a good book, it was very um, thoughty and had a lot of ellipses and a lot of question marks and bibbity bobbity boo I rewrote it the best I could, but I don't know who wrote that book, so I have no relationship to him. I just looked at it as an editor. So I, I feel that way about a lot of them. I'm really glad I did it. You know, it beats washing windows for a living. I used to do that too, but. <laughs> I guess, though, if you're a playwright, a novelist, it stays on the shelf. People pick it up and they go, well, here's this book you wrote at this time. But if somebody does say Oleana now, then there's a whole, in, there's a whole thing that cranks up by dint of the production, if you know what I mean. It's sort of somebody calls you, it all, there's a whole media thing. If it's a big production, the play is re-examined in the context of the current moment. It's a little different, it seems to me, for a playwright when your plays are like you are constantly being redone and then applied in a new era. Well, that's true. Um, I, I was extraordinarily fortunate and I was here as a part of the, uh, uh, the era of the burgeoning of Chicago theater. We didn't know any better and there was no money involved and we did it because we loved it. And all of us were absolutely there was no question in any of our mind that whenever we put on a play, there was no better theater being done any place in the world that night. As <laughs> we were young and talented and, 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 and uh, full of spunk, and, 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 and we just loved doing it. And uh, I just wrote a new play, and a lot of people lo uh, looked at the new play, it hasn't been done yet, and they said, you can't do this, you're out of your fucking mind. You can't do this play. But it occurred to me, people have been saying that to me for 50 years. <laughs> so there's, uh, there's an interesting... Uh, um, process of aging, which you bring up, like when we first did uh, my play Oleana with Re Rebecca Pigeon and Billy Macy in New York, the people came very close to rioting. Just about every night there was a fight in the audience, seriously, it was a fight in the audience every night, and well, the woman who replaced Rebecca actually got punched coming out of the stage door, people would scream at each other, and now that's kind of become part of the, become part of the culture, or as... Uh, William Maxwell said, time will darken it, you know, but it, it's an interesting <laughs> process. But some people um, who perhaps are, are less arrogant or, 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 uh, than I would say, okay, you know, I'm gonna, let's play these, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll settle down and write a play about moderately difficult things happening to moderately interesting people. <laughs> but I was very, very fortunate in the way I brought up, was brought up that, that uh, I didn't have to do that. I think people sometimes wonder about you, to what extent are you fundamentally a satirist? That is to say, uh, it's a question that's come up for years about you, when, whether it's about, say, your book about acting, or your, uh, let's say, your pronouncement that there shall be no talkbacks after, after your plays, which I must say, I kind of like because I can't stand them, but, but some people feel differently. Um, is it, you know, my question, is, it, is, is he, does he mean it? Um, this is this novel feels extraordinarily sincere to me somehow, but what about the broader question? So what? Uh, t tell me again. What what what, what broader question are you, are you saying? To what extent have you? Are you now, or have you ever been a satirist? I don't think I've ever been a satirist. I, th I think I've been a farceur. A lot of my plays are farces, but I I, I don't think I've ever been a, I've never been a satirist, because. I didn't go to Yale. <laughs> <laughs> and I actually, you know, I, I think things are funnier than that. You know, as Mel, Mel Brooks said, you know, anybody, Mel Brooks said, anybody can laugh at an actor dressed up like a little old lady in a wheelchair falling downstairs. But if you're really a comedian, it's gotta be a real little old lady. <laughs> Thank you.
What about this? What about this? This talkback thing that got everybody all excited about on the when you said oh, like it's such it's such bullshit. Listen, here's the thing. <laughs> the theater. The, here's the thing. When I was a kid, there was uh, the Goodman Theater, which did bad productions of Eugene O'Neill. <laughs> right? And on the other hand, there was the there was Ravinia, which did bad productions of Eugene O'Neill. And there was nothing in between except the community theater production, where we, uh, community theater movement, where they did bad productions of Charlie's Aunt and Ten Nights in a Turkish, Turkish Bath. And then out of nowhere, out of the mind of Bob Sickinger and Jim Shiflett and the late Stuart, Bob Sickinger, Stuart, yeah. Stuart, <laughs> Stuart Gordon and yeah. a couple of other people, this movement came, and also out of Second City, you know, I went out of the Compass and Shelley Berman and Building Silence and all those guys. This movement arose in Chicago out of burbling out of the sand of let's put on plays, let's write new plays. And, and, and put on those plays. You have to tell me, I'm so in love with the sound of my own voice, you have to tell me what the question was again. <laughs> I don't know that it was relating to that answer, but... Oh, I'll get to uh, it. Trust me. Okay. <laughs> you know, when you, uh, you said this to our, our mutual friend Rick Hogan, uh, yeah. the Tribune on Sunday, every society has to confront the ungovernable genie of sexuality and tries various ways to deal with it and none of them work very well. There is great difficulty when you are switching modes, which is what we seem to be doing now. Yes. People go crazy, they start tearing each other to bits. Yeah, so the, the theater exists as we discovered um, idiosyncratically out of nowhere. And the, the theater exists to uh, express otherwise incontectable perceptions about human behavior. The theater doesn't really come from entertainment. The theater originally comes from religion. So it, it, uh, it allows us to say there's something happening. I don't know what the hell it is. We can call it God or we could call it maybe it's another guy of the same name. But something is happening here that I, that that is beyond our control, which is what the Bible is about, the Old Testament's about, is everything beyond your control. We try to do good, we do ill, we try to love each other, we, we hate each other, mm -hmm. we, we, we follow, as Aristotle said, we follow a perfectly planned a form of a, a plan of action down to the end, which we find that we've just destroyed ourselves and everything that we and everything that we love. So the theater is the counterbalance to uh, a, a rational understanding of life. It's a myth, which is not to say that it's not true, but that it's irrational. It deals with our dream life in the same way, and as Freud said, that, that music is polymorphous perversity. It makes sense, and we say that's true, but we can't really say why. Mm -hmm. So that there, because the theater is so uh, potentially affecting, as Shakespeare said, I've been told that gri guilty creatures sitting at a play may be so moved to, to their blah, blah, blah that they act against their better natures. Yes. In Hamlet, yeah. because the theater has that potential, we try, the conscious mind tries to, to disarm it. And how do we know? I'll tell you how we know, because people always come late to the theater. Nobody comes late to the movies, <laughs> right? People always come late to the theater. And what's the other thing that everybody always comes late to? Anybody? They come late to church, <laughs> right? They don't come late to the soccer game, but they come late to church. Why do they come late to church? And why do they come late to the theater? Why do we do these things? Because there's something in us that's guarding our most precious possession, which is our erroneous understanding of our own rationality. So people are frightened of the theater on some level. Well, uh, frightened is a, is a good word, you know, and they, they say in, the, in, in, in Hebrew, they say that you should fear God. The word actually in Hebrew is closer to the word awe, that you should have awe of God. And so the people have a, 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 an, in, an unquenchable, unconscious awe of, a, of the theatrical interchange, actual people sitting on stage, acting out something that those people out there, we out there, have suspended our disbelief sufficiently for to understand, oh my God, that's just like me, which may, as Aristotle said, move us at the end of the play to fear and pity, mm -hmm. right? 
Yeah. To, to pity the poor son of a bitch <laughs> and fear, oh my God, that's just like me. So one of the ways that we try to disarm the power of the theater is by coming late. Another way in which we try to disarm the power of the theater is by interposing uh, a critical establishment, right? Which may be... Um, um, Excuse me? <laughs> I'm working on it. <laughs> It may, in effect, actually be benign, which is to say, and I am the great uh, recipient of it, in, in, in the work of his, uh, Richard Christensen, also yeah. in the work of, of Roger Ebert and Gene Siskel, it may actually be the work of a person who so loves the form that he wants to uh, uh, write about it uh, out of love, mm. which is a great help, right? Or it may be the other thing where the critic understands his or her job is to be to knock off anything which isn't immediately uh, categorizable as as brilliance, which is to say, give me some mediocrity, right? So, the, but in another way, to diffuse the power of the theater is to break the fourth wall, and to say the actors and this blah blah are going to come on stage, and rather than letting you guys alone. Or as Shakespeare says, you this way, we that way, letting you go home and think about it and talk to each other. We'll say, well, let's talk it to death. Let's pretend that we're all bad English teachers and talk, <laughs> about, talk about the themes involved. Right? right. So one way to diffuse a, a, the very deep theatrical experience is to talk about the theme. I don't know what the themes are in any of my plays. It's a play. If you can reduce it to a theme, you know, if you can go out humming the theme, you could come in humming the theme. So it's been so one. There was a guy called Danny Newman who yeah. wrote a book right called here in Chicago. Yeah. Um, <laughs> subscribe now. Subscribe now. <laughs> so Danny Newman shows up. He's a very smart guy. He's a Chicagoan guy, and he says, "Here's how you get people into the theater: you make up a subscription series and you sell a subscription series." But what happens is. As the Italians told us, anybody who has a partner has a master. So if you have a theater and it's got a managing director and it's got an artistic director, right, what you have is a managing director and a lackey, right, mm -hmm. because the, the bad money is always going to drive out the good money. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you say the purpose of the theater is not for Stuart Gordon or Billy Peterson or John Malkovich or me or Billy Macy or whoever to say, or Greg Moshe, this is the way it is. Um, let's put on a goddamn play. Somebody comes in and says, yes, well, you don't want to risk your, your base, so let's put on a subscription series. And we'll say five plays for the, the, for the price of four. But that's not why we go to the theater. Mm. It makes sense, except it's wrong, right? <laughs> Nobody goes to the theater and they say, where can we get a 25% discount? <laughs> The, the, the only play that you and you and I want to go to is the one that says, that everybody says, you can't get a ticket. Yeah. Right? right. So, so, I mean, so this is a very overlong response, but, you know, if you wanted to, like, you know. Let, let me ask you delicately about aging. Like, you were, you, you perceived for most of your life as a young writer. It's probably pressing it now to say you're a young writer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, I would imagine if I were you with this new play you're working on, um, that you, there must be some resistance in you that goes, oh my God, I, and I really want to go to the wall again. Do I really want to deal with all this? Which I guess is a roundabout way of asking a, almost a legacy question, I suppose, or a sense of, are you weary of any controversy? Are you, uh, or, or do you retain the energy that you had? Or, or do you act without regard to any of these criteria? You just write, and this is what you write? Well, I'd like to quote two people on the subject. It's a very good question. <laughs> the first one is Archimedes, right? Who Archimedes responded, you know what Archimedes responded to his critics? He said, fulcrum if they can't take a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so... <laughs> <laughs> so, th so, that's, so that's that's my first one. And the second one is, I, I was reading the story of Samson, right? You remember Samson? Yeah. Okay, good. So it occurs to me, Samson is the story of an artist. It's a magnificent story of an artist. Here's a guy who's given a gift from God. 
and God says, okay, we're going to give you this gift. You're going to be the strongest guy in the world. There's just one thing. Don't cut your hair. So I says, okay, I get it. I'll do that. Strongest guy in the world, you know, lots of girlfriends, lots of fun, lots of uh, 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 a well-deserved praise, having a wonderful time. So he meets this woman who says, okay, you just have to tell me your secret. You have to tell me your secret. You have to tell me your secret. Right? And the truth is, I believe, and, and every artist, at some point, there's that secret, there's that thing that you just, you can't say. You have a certain relationship with something, whether you call it talent, or whether you call it the audience, or whether you call it the mm. divine, or the universe. There's this something that is in you, and you know when you're doing it right, and when you're doing it wrong, and you know when you're betraying it, and there's, as you become successful, there's always that little voice, which we Jews know as the Yetzer Hara, <laughs> the spirit of evil, that says, oh, come on, a little bit, a little bit ain't gonna hurt you. A little bit ain't gonna hurt you. So eventually, a little bit ain't gonna hurt you, and Samson says to the light, okay, cut off my hair, they cut off his hair, and his eyes are put out, and he's bound between pillars in Gaza, and he's made mock of. And so what does he do? He says, God, I've made a terrible, terrible mistake. Please, 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 God, forgive me. Uh, you asked me to do one simple thing, and I couldn't do it, and I've been justly punished. And he prays for the, the, the strength yet again to, uh, betray, to uh, be, be true, to, be true uh, to his vow. And that's the end of that story. So I always thought that's a story about an artist. So you don't crave love from those who consume your work? No, the, no, the only love I, I crave is, is like all that there is. <laughs> <laughs> but times do change. I mean, I, 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 let me try this one more time. Like times do change. Yeah. There are decent artists who adapt to the times, who will consciously say, okay, this is now what the people want. You appear not to be in that number. Well, you know, you're asking very, very good questions, but I, I just, uh, I got this great gift. You know, I grew up uh, uh, in Chicago, my wonderful middle-class family, I'd, but it's like, you know, you're 17 years old, uh, nice to see you, have a good time. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have any skills, and I didn't have any money, and I didn't have any prospects. And uh, I did every menial job in the world, and um, was glad to have the money. And I just always felt like this wretched, wretched failure who was going to end up sleeping under a bridge. And then I found that I could write, and I said, okay, you know, ch choice is yours. You want to you do it? Or you want to say, well, you know, what I could have been. It's, it's like somebody, it, it's, I got to be the pretty girl at the party for 50 years, right? And so what, what, what the universe or God was saying to me was, okay, but do the best you can. So I, uh, I try. You know, I'm sure I fail sometimes, but I, but I try. So it's not a question of adapting myself to the times because the best thing that I can do to my, for my audience is to do the best I can as a writer. I mean, I don't know what other what, what other in a formative is. in a when you say the best you can as a writer. Yeah. What does that mean? That means, I, I was writing something about a young writer the other day. I said, if you're a writer, you better be thinking one of two things: either this will kill him, or this will kill me. <laughs> so that's what that means. You said I, I remember you saying once when talking about the difference between film writing, which you've obviously done a lot of, and playwriting, I think you said, correct me if I'm wrong, something along the lines of, in a movie, it's really all about plot. And in a play, it's more about ideas. Here you are with a novel. What's, it, what's the form of the novel, right? I mean, what's, what's a novel? Well, no, a play is all about plot. That's all there is in a play is plot. Oh, okay. And that's all there is in a picture is a movie's plot. But the difference is, as Eisenstein told us, the plot is advanced in a, in, in a, pic, in a movie through the juxtaposition of images, and it's uh, advanced in a play through, the, through dialogue. Hmm. But in, in a, a, a novel is the epic form, and you get to, you get to explore ideas, and you get to uh, uh, veer off here and veer off there, and you know, write about Father Zosima if you want to. You know, it's a fucking commie, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, uh, <laughs> 
I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> 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 Because you have some dialogic scenes in this, and then you have yeah. scenes of epic description. Yeah. Well, so the so so the the story is about this guy who comes home from the war, and he's a war hero, and he's a crime writer, and he gets his his his, uh, his girlfriend killed, and he spends the the book trying to find out how he can live in a world where he got his girlfriend killed, who killed her, why they killed her, and what he can do about it. So that's that's the that's the plot of of. Of, of the book, but one gets to expatiate, you know, just like Tolstoy said, okay, you know, uh, I, I once wrote, uh, I, I do a lot of cartoons, I was influenced by Shel Silverstein, one of them was uh, The Little Engine That Could, written by Leo Tolstoy. <laughs> and it's a cartoon, and Leo told, and The Little Engine That Could is saying, oh no, a Russian noblewoman distressed by love, has thrown herself over the tracks. But I must get the toys to the good little children. Oh, well, ding, ding. <laughs> so, so you could reduce the plot of Anna Karenina to that. But, you know, he gets he throws in all kinds of other crap in there, too. You know. Let's, uh, you know, when you guys walked in, I believe some of you filled out some cards. This always terrifies me, but I'm gonna take some questions from the good people. Are you ready? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I got one yesterday, it was who do you like in the third at Aqueduct, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what influence did your father's work have on your writing? Well, my father was a, uh, 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 a Chicago lawyer, one horse Chicago lawyer, and great lawyer, and um, very, very, very hard worker. Whatever I wrote, he would say, this is great, but you know, it seems to me this character you're writing would be better served if he were like a hard-hitting immigrant labor lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to tell a story about, uh, I, I, I'm sure I've told this story before. Did I ever tell you guys the story about my dad in the opening night of American Buffalo? No, you know, I don't know that story. Okay, <laughs> so we did this show, American Buffalo, and we did it here, and it opened at the, at the Goodman. Uh, the Goodman did it in a little theater for 12 performances, and we moved to the St. Nicholas, and then we did it in New York. And it was opening night, and Irv Copson was there, and, and uh, Essie Copson was there, and my family was there, Judy was there, and the kids, and my dad was there. And it was, and it was Robert Duvall and Kenny McMillan and uh, Savage, uh, Jim Savage, and... and um, we're getting the reviews, and the reviews come, one review is the Chicago, whatever it was, and there were like four papers in New York at the time. Those were the days. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Great review in the Daily News, genius review in the Daily News, genius review in the Post, genius review in the New York, New York Star Ledger, genius review in Philadelphia Inquirer, and everyone's very, very glum as we're waiting for the reviews. And my dad says, well, these are great reviews, what the hell, what's the problem? They say, we're waiting for the New York Times. And my dad says, well, are you, but these are great. Could the New York Times kill it by a bad review? And everyone says, then as now, yes, that's what they do. You know? So <laughs> we have to wait for the New York Times. And my dad says, what did it cost to put this production up? And the producer says, it cost $750,000. And my dad says, and the New York Times, it was Lynn Clive Barnes, says, what does he make in a year? And the guy says, he makes about, about 30 grand. <laughs> my dad said, are you nuts? <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's one of the many things I, I learned from, from my dad. Was he very proud? What, what was, it, he must have been, what was his reaction to that play? He loved it. He, he was so, it was wonderful. He was really, really proud of me. He loved it. But he's one of the things he said. So it opens on Broadway, you know, it's a, it's a big hit. And he says, when are you going to scrap all this nonsense and go to Northwestern Law School? <laughs> <laughs> so here's another thing I learned from my dad. My dad was uh, raised by a, he and his brother were raised by a single mom during the Depression and, and uh, went off to the, the Army and he came back and he got into... Um, Northwestern Law School on a scholarship. 
and he'd gone to Wilson Junior College, which he always referred to as the University of Southern Wilson. <laughs> and for two years, he got in, and um, he eventually graduated first in his class, and he was on a scholarship where they gave him a, a full scholarship and $250 a year to live on. And so he got a job uh, selling shoes and uh, to support himself. And he was selling shoes someplace downtown, and Northwestern Law School was then at Navy Pier. And the bursar came in and recognized him. And they called him in uh, to the office, and they said, you're a Jew, you know, you're here on a quota. We've given you, how can you uh, betray us and your people? But, so he had to go, Weep, 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 weep. I'm so sorry. Please don't kick me out. Please don't kick me out. And then he got a job selling shoes in Berwyn. So, <laughs> but he was a he was the hardest working man I ever saw, and that was the most one of the most important uh, influences in my life. Who do you feel are the best actors? You better say your wife here, who do you feel are the best actors to ever play any of your characters? Oh, that's, that's great. I've, I've been really, really, really fortunate. I've worked with the, the greatest actors in the world and uh, off the top of my head, uh, 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 Tony Hopkins and Helen Mirren and Al Pacino and Gene Hackman and Bob De Niro and uh, Jack Nicholson. And uh, I, I just got, I got a chance to work with everybody. It's, it's, uh, do you have a marvel that they can do your work? I, I sometimes think, you know, it's like actors are like sacred people almost. They can walk into a room. You can throw your precise, you know, you can throw at them. Your stuff isn't easy, and yet great ones can just kind of pull it off. Well, see, I, 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 I take the opposite view, but the reason I take that view is I can't act. And I was once doing an interview with, and Billy Macy and I were up on the stage. Somebody asked me about acting. I said, I'd, I'd be the first person in the world to tell, tell you that I can't act. And Macy said, no, you'd be the second one. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see dangers of political correctness in writing and theater? Yeah, there's dangers of political correctness. I, you know, had a gobbler. Where did Hella Gobbler? Where, where was it first performed? Anybody know? It was performed in Chicago. I think it was actually performed. Yeah, it was right this in, building, I think. Right actually. on the stage. Actually, it's not. It was performed in Iowa, actually. I was think. It? I think it was. Oh, okay. But but yes. You, very you, very soon here. That's you're, you're ruining my story. Okay. <laughs> and the other thing is, I was reading Ben Hecht. Anybody? Ben Hecht was uh, wrote our best play. The front page with, uh, with Charles MacArthur and was a, a reporter for the Daily News, and he wrote a column called. Uh, it was eventually put in book form called "One Thousand and One Afternoons in Chicago," which is the best journalism anybody ever read. It was like three or four years of he would go out and he'd write 700 words a day and whatever caught his fancy. And one of the things he rep reported on was the world premiere of "The Love of Three Oranges" by Prokofiev, which nobody would do. It had its world premiere at Orchestra Hall. So, um, political correctness, I mean, listen, that's one of the ways in which we try to deal with art is to make it political. And uh, it just, it just, it looks like a good idea. And people say, you know, so-and-so, that son's that changed my life. I say, oh, really? Does a play change your life? Not a it's, it's not the purpose of the theater to change your life or to give you the ideas of the author, right? But maybe it might, uh, it might relieve you for a moment from the burden of uh, your own consciousness, which will bring you closer to the divine. And I think that's probably something better to do than to teach you what you already knew, which whoever the other son of a bitch is, is a son of a bitch, right? Hmm. Which is what all political writing is about. So that's a very spiritual view of the thing. I mean, it's a, it's, I thought you were going to say that when you said relieve you from the burden, I thought that was sort of an argument for comedy, but then you veered in a different way and you sort of said it's veering, it allows you to escape the burdens of consciousness to some degree. Yeah, sure. I mean, as they say, whoever arises refreshed from his prayers, his prayers have been answered. I mean, that's what the theater is good for. You know, whether it's tragedy or comedy, and I go back and forth about thinking which is the higher form. It relieves you from the burden of your, of, of, of each of our 
incredible unrest at our own humanity, because it's not a lot of fun to be human, and some of the things which are the most fun, like anger and arrogance and, and rage and self-loathing and so forth, are, are dreadful for you, and they don't belong as part of your daily life. So one of the ways in which we can put them down is through the experience of art, which can't be retranslated in, into, because it's, it can't be retranslated into rational thought, because if it could, it's not art. But, but you've delved into things that you have to say. I mean, I remember you wrote an article in Newsweek, as I recall, at one point, did you not? I mean, oh, yes, I, I, did, I wrote a lot of nonfiction, uh, nonfiction in, in, in my life, and I did a little bit of political uh, writing in my life because I thought, you know what, you're too comfortable and you're making too much money. Why don't you get yourself blacklisted? So... <laughs> <laughs> you did pretty well. <laughs> oh, yeah. Worked great, yeah. Would you want to write the screenplay of this book? Has it been an option for one? Would you want to write the screenplay and direct the film? That's a good question. Great I, question. I was thinking about that. I was thinking, you know, like making a, a movie out of, out of your book is like raping your children to teach them about sex. <laughs> <laughs> so no is the answer. <laughs> Aside from the classicists, Aside from the classicists, yeah. who is your favorite playwright other than yourself? I would say uh, he uh, Hector MacArthur, who wrote the front page. Really? Oh, yeah. Wrote the front page. Harold Pinter, uh, Beckett, uh, Bill Shakespeare, Billy Shaperstein, before he had to change his name. <laughs> <laughs> this question makes the assumption in the preamble to the question that you have, in fact, perfected your craft. As you perfect your craft, does the writing get easier? No, no, the writing gets harder. Why for, does it get harder? Well, for two reasons. One is the more, you know, somebody once, Shaperstein said, thus conscience doth make cowards of us all, right? And uh, enterprises of great pith and merit, their various currents turn awry and lose the name of action, right? Because the more you know about plot, the more one knows about plot, the harder one has to work. Uh, to, at, on the one hand, on the other hand, the ability to write a dialogue and to write very, very free-flowing dialogue has a lot to do with your short-term memory. You know, as you get old, you can't remember anything. So it's, it, I, I work a lot harder on, on writing dialogue, and I also work a lot harder on, on writing plot. Where would you like to see Oleana stage today? Uh, I would, uh, you, oh, and, would and you know, uh, you know, I'd like to see it staged everywhere simultaneously. <laughs> I, I like it already. Right. Because is there, what line, is, the question is asking what line people say when they see you on the street. And the, like we say, oh, David Mama, oh, oh, that they, line. Oh, they say, they say coffee is for closers, which is great. And always be closing. Always be closing. Yeah. So, that's, so that's, that's, that's. Does that happen? You're walking down, you're walking on the Santa Monica Pier and someone goes, David Mama, always be closing. No, because everybody on the Santa Monica Pier is stoned out of their mind. <laughs> <laughs> what was Francis Parker like when you were there? Did your teachers encourage your writing? Oh, Francis Parker was magnificent. I spent two years there, 1963 to 65, and I was, for some magnificent reason, I was adopted by both the student body, which is very uh, closed. It was the closed very close, uh, multi-generational, uh, mainly intellectual, and uh, the, the children of intellectual and professional Jews on the north side of Chicago. And they were real smart and real funny. And they adopted me, you know, this schmuck kid from been living in Olympia Fields, Illinois, and, you know, in the model house in the middle of a, a, a mud field. And, and um, Equally, the, the teachers loved me, and I could never tell why, because I failed at all my classes. But they, um, they just, they loved me, and um, I, I'm, I'm constantly grateful to them. I was uh, 
talking to one of my crusty editors, I said, I'm terrified to be interviewing David Mavin. And he said, well, you need an icebreaker joke. And I said, I, I don't have the guts for an icebreaker joke. He said, so we'll try this one. And he said, uh, there's a homeless guy. Um, uh, there's a guy in a suit walks by and the homeless guy says, can you give me a loan? And the guy in the suit says, uh, neither, a neither a borrower nor a lender be Shakespeare. And the homeless guy says, fuck you, you fucking fuck, David Mamet. <laughs> David Mamet, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you all. That was such fun. Thank you so much. Oh my God, that was fun.